Okay, you ready? Yeah. Okay. Um, just want to uh, dedicate this uh, share in memory of Rabbi Bernie Zeller, who passed away recently, and uh, my cousin, uh, Kalman Nishurin, who passed away Friday, both passed away Friday. Uh, and uh, just there's a certain sense of sadness that I have when I think about the, the passing of both of them. Um, the to, the share is about Jam Yerushalayim this week. I don't know, it's probably going to be a mitch of some sort, but uh, this week, I think Friday, is uh, Yom Yerushalayim. And uh, I want to discuss the significance of the recognition of Yerushalayim as the capital of Israel. Some would have said, and I'm sure there are those who say it, even among those who are, are uh, members of our own faith, for those who are religiously oriented, even among them, that what was the purpose? Who cares if the United States recognizes Yerushalayim as the capital of Israel? What, why is it significant? And, you know, what do we care if the ambassador of the United States, every time he wants to have a meeting with the prime minister of Israel, has to take a, 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 a trip from Tel Aviv to Yerushalayim. But I think there is halachic significance in the recognition by the United States of Yerushalayim as the capital of Israel. Now, the truth, about uh, two years ago, I was asked by a, a rabbi in Florida, in the Boynton Beach Rabbi Cement, to speak about what I thought my father would say about it and what I thought my uncle would say about it. Now, that's very, you know, there are all kinds of people who quote what my father or my uncle would have said about many different issues. And they're not always correct. And anything we say, uh, to a certain degree, is conjecture. But uh, very often, when people suggest things, it's based on what they want to believe. So we have to try to be as objective as possible. And I think that both my father and my uncle would have felt very strongly that the recognition of Yerushalayim as the capital of Israel was very important, but for altogether two different reasons. Today, I'm going to focus why I think my father would have felt that way. Another time, I'll discuss why I think, and again, it's what I think, why my uncle would have been in favor. And it's an altogether different perspective. Now, Rashi, at the beginning of Bracious, mentions Rav Yitzchak, which is brought down, Rav Yitzchak is brought down in the Medrash Tanchuma. Uh, there are those who believe that Rashi was actually quoting his father, but it's really, it is, it's, it's one of Chazal who's quoted in the Medrash Tan Chumah. And the question is, why does Chumash Bereshis have to start off with the story of the creation of the world? And, and the, the Rashi says, well, it, it, it really, Chumash Bereshis, and this is the Medrash, should have started off, not Bereshis, it wouldn't have been Bereshis then. The Torah should have started off with HaChodesh Hazel Lachem Rosh Chadashim, Shehi Mitzvah Rishon HaShnitl Yisrael. Because the definition of Torah is that which was given to Moshe Rabbeinu. Now it's true. There are mitzvos mentioned in Sefer Bereshis. 
long before Moshe Rabbeinu was born. Per Yavarivya, Brismila, Gid Hanoshe. And depending on which shita, there might be other mitzvahs as well. But the Rambam in the parish of Mishnah points out that these mitzvahs only became obligatory on the Jewish people of future generations because these parshas were told over to Moshe Har Sinai. Because the definition of Torah is that which was given to Moshe. Now the mitzvah of HaChodesh Hazel Lachem, which is the mitzvah of the Jewish calendar, of declaring the new, of recognizing or declaring the new month, that was a mitzvah, that was the first mitzvah given to Moshe. And the understanding of the question is, the Torah is not a history book. The Torah is not the biography of individuals. The Torah is a book of Jewish law. And being a book of Jewish law, it should have started off with HaChodesh HaZeh Lachem Rosh Chadashim. And Rashi says, the reason the Torah tells us about Bereshis is Koach Mais of Higid Liyama. The strength of his deeds, he quotes a pasuk. The strength of his deeds, he told his nation. If the nations of the world will say, list them at them. You are robbers. You stole the land of Israel from the seven nations of the world, from the seven nations of Canaan. Have a yomer lehem. You should tell them God created the world and he gave it to whoever he chose to. And, and, and he, he took it away from whoever he chose to take it away from and gave it, and gave it to us. And the question arises, why is it that the, the, what is the answer to the question? The question was, why does the Torah start off with Bereshis, Bar Elikim, Eshashemayim, Besaritz, with the story of creation. The, the Torah is a book of Jewish law. So apparently the, must got mo, the, Ram, the Rashi must be pointing out that there is a reason in regard to Eretz Yisrael that we have to know that God created the world. And it's and part of the law is one of us saying. Now, what the question is, what and then? Why does it say koach ma'isav higid lamav? If it's in order to inform the nations of the world, it should say. And these are questions that everybody asks. It should say koach ma'isav higid lumos olam. The strength of his deeds, he told the nations of the world, because they have to be the ultimate recipient of this answer. We have to tell it to them. And then the third thing is, um, do you think, I remember, you know, during the Six Day War, I was a high school student at the time, and I was listening to the, the speeches at the UN. And I remember the uh, ambassador from Saudi Arabia at that time, uh, Saudi Arabia was at the forefront of the battle against Israel. And the ambassador from Saudi Arabia got up and gave a whole speech how Israel stole, how Israel stole the land from the Palestinians and from the Arabs. And so you think, if the ambassador from Israel, at that time, the one who spoke on behalf of the state of Israel was Abba Ibn. He did a very good job in his speech. But uh, do you think that if Abba Ibn had stood up on the podium at the UN and took, in at, took out Chumash Barashas and read Barashas Bar Elikim Eshashamayim Vesaretz, 
God created the heaven and earth. So the, 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 the ambassador of Saudi Arabia would get up and say, oh, now that you told me this, you're right, I agree, the land of Israel belongs to the Jewish people. Obviously, that would never have happened. So the question is, so what is the purpose? If the purpose is for us to tell the nations of the world that God gave us the land of Israel, so what is the purpose of telling it to them when we know that they're going to reject it outright? There's no purpose. So uh, now when we take a look in Parsha Shalach. And there, Moshe Rabbeinu sends out 12 spies, one representative of each Shevet, of each tribe. And they tried burst their Israel together. It seems that Kalev went to certain areas by himself, especially in Hebron. But the, the, but for the most part, all 12 spies came back and two spies, 10 spies gave a disastrous report. They talked about the strength of the Canaanites, how the Jewish people would never be able to overcome the Canaanites in battle. They talked how they were like grasshoppers in comparison with the Canaanites. And two, Yoshua and Kalev gave a very positive report. They said, We can do it. Even without super, supernatural uh, miracles. We can do it. We can do it. The Arashnuosa. And we'll conquer it. And the Arashnu is conquer and inherit. And we have to understand that they, why was there two completely different reports? When they saw the same thing, this was a question that my father would raise when he would speak about Parsha Shlach. Maybe when we get to Parsha Shlach, I'll discuss my father's answer. And I'll discuss more at length uh, my, own, the, my own answer. I'm just bringing it in here in a short way. But the, I think that the difference was the following. There is no doubt that from a military perspective, the, the Canaanites were a lot stronger than, uh, than, the, than the Jewish people. But it was the feeling of Kalev and Yehoshua that they would be able to overcome the military advantage of the Canaanites. And the reason for this is there is a rush. I uh, had me mentioned this shot uh, shortly after the Six Day War. Uh, there, is a there is a rush in Bava Metzia that says that sometimes a person who has the psychological advantage of ownership could overcome the, the physical advantage of strength. And I think we could apply it here too. In other words, and the rest says, a person is more determined to keep what he knows is his than to take what he knows belongs to somebody else. Now, Eretz Yisrael is an inheritance. God gave the land of Eretz Yisrael to Avram Avinu, to Yitzchak, to Yaakov, to Abraham, to Isaac, 
and to Jacob. And if we recognize that Eretz Yisrael was given to them and we inherited the land, we were not going to the land of Israel to take the land away from people who it belonged to. On the contrary, we were going to come to keep the land that belonged to others, to, to, uh, that belonged to ourselves. I know a person could suggest, well, the Canaanites also thought that the land belonged to them. And the truth is that the, our sages tell us and uh, in, the, in commenting on various psukim and lech lecha, that the, the Canaanites conquered the land of Israel from the Bnei Shem. The land of Israel originally was given to Shem, the son of Noah. And the and Jewish people are descendants of Shem. And the Canaanites conquered the land. So it wasn't land that was originally theirs in the first place. They knew that they were only occupiers. They conquered the land. And furthermore, the knowledge that the land was the feeling of ownership that is based on the knowledge it was given to us by God. Through Avram Avinu, through Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That feeling of ownership is the strongest possible feeling of ownership possible. And I think this is what Rashi is telling us. Rashi is telling us that when the nations of the world will scream, list them at them. You are robbers. You stole the land. You are occupiers. It's not your land. We have to tell them. Not that they're going to accept what we say. But why we have to tell them? Because unfortunately, our perspective is very much influenced by the attitudes of the nations of the world. This is certainly true in Chutzlar, it's outside the land of Israel, certainly in on an individual level, but even on a community level. Rabbi Yehuda HaChassid in the Sefer HaChassidim says, Mina Yehudim, the custom of the Jewish people, Jewish people, Afilu HaTov Shebehem, even the best from among them, is like the custom of the nations of the world in whose midst they dwell. And it's very interesting. In Parshas Chukas, the Torah says in regard to the Paraduma, the burning of the red cow, which is the ultimate, the ultimate chok, the ultimate decree of the Torah, Zos Chukas at Torah. It's a decree. Shlomo HaMelech, King Solomon, the wisest of all men, said he could understand everything. But the reason for Paraduma, he couldn't understand. It's not that there wasn't a reason. There certainly is a reason for Paraduma. But it was beyond our grasp, our ability to understand. And Rashi at the beginning, why does the Torah call it Chukas Torah? Why does it say, this is the decree of the Torah, this is the decree of God? Because Umo Solom, the nations of the world, Manan Es Yisrael, they intellectually try to torture the Jewish people. And they say, Mam Hamitzvah Hazos, they come and say, 
let's have a economical meeting. Let us try to understand your religion. And they'll say, they'll say, what is the re what is this mitzvah? Explain it to me. I don't understand it. And what's the reason for it? Knowing that we could not accurately explain the reason for the mitzvah paraduma. Because even the wisest of all men was not able to explain the reason for paraduma. So we have to tell them, Chuka, it's a chok. It's a decree from God. We submit to his decree even when we don't understand it. But why did the Torah have to emphasize this point? The Torah had to emphasize this point because the Torah knew the psychology of the Jews throughout the generations to somehow become influenced by the attitude of the nations around us and especially among the nations within whom we dwell. And it's very interesting. My father mentioned to me actually a number of times, my father mentioned that the Maharetzchias, you'll find it in the Kol Kispe Maharetzchias. Uh, lived in the, in the 1800s. Uh, he, he was very broad in his perspective, but one of the outstanding scholars of his time. And his thinking was very, very progressive, but he remained, he was a loyal, loyal to the Torah to the nth degree. And Maritzchias wrote a whole book to show that the Jewish people did not use blood of non-Jews in their matzah, not, not, no, no human blood. And he points out that the prohibition of Ritzicha, the prohibition of murder, applies even when one murders a non-Jew. And he points out all kinds of reasons. Because at that time, the Jewish people would suffer from blood libels, especially close to Pesach time. All of a sudden, many, many, many non-Jews would go around and accuse Jews of murdering non-Jewish children to take their blood in the matzah. And he listed all the prohibitions that would be involved in doing something like that. He even points out that according to some opinions, if you would take blood and put it into matzah, the matzah would become chametz. And the question is, who did the Maharitzkias write this book for? Did he write it for the masses of people that used to make pogroms against the Jews in the different villages before Passover? Did he, did he write this book to those who instigated that the masses in those days, they were illiterate. They were not capable of reading anything even in their own language. Did he write it for those who instigated these pogroms? Who certainly knew it was false. And most of the time, certainly, they, they were capable of reading their own language. I doubt they were capable of reading Hebrew. So, who did he write it for? Apparently, there must have been some Jews who were influenced, who perhaps considered themselves progressive, who were influenced by what was going on in the street, what people were saying in the street. And they might have thought, maybe there are some extremists among us 
to do this terrible thing. So the Maritz Pius had to compose a whole work to show that it's impossible. But he didn't write it for the non-Jews. He wrote that work for the Jews because that's perhaps, this is to some degree part of our gullus mentality. And we still have a bit of a servile perspective dating back to Egypt. So, so the, 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 um, so the, 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 the Torah was aware, HaKadosh Baruch Hu certainly knew, that the Jewish people, many of them, and listen, I remember the war in 67. I was a, I was a high school student at the time. And at that time, no one would have said, you stole the land. We were all standing in fear and trepidation, thinking about the thousands upon thousands of people who were going to be wiped out. Who doesn't remember the threat of Nasser Yamachimo? That he was going to drive the Jewish people into the sea. We see what the Arabs do today to each other. Can you imagine what they would have done to the Jewish people? And there was a sense of fear. And especially among those who remembered the war years, those who were young, they thought chas v'shalom, what will happen to the Jews in Israel? And then all of a sudden, there was this miraculous victory. Six days. And th there was no way to describe. In fact, we use the word, the high that we, the Jewish people, were on. The joy, the happiness, we weren't happy at those, because of those that were killed, whether they were Jewish or non-Jewish, but we were happy with our survival and we were happy with the accomplishments of the Israeli army. And, and that in those days, who would have believed that Jews would have said that, would, that we are occupiers? It was unbelievable. But afterwards, after hearing time and time again in the UN, that the Jewish people are, the Jewish people invaded the lands of the Arabs when they know that there was Nasser who closed the Straits of Aqaba and who said he's going to wage war, who threw out the UN troops from the Sinai. And we saw the aid that Uthant the Secretary General of the UN at the time, how he played together with Nasser and immediately removed the troops that blockaded, that separated the state of Israel from those that wanted to destroy it. And that there was a lesson perhaps that the state of Israel received at that time. You can't depend on anybody else. Only in HaTadosh Baruch Hu and in Yisrael. 
So we, we, but shortly afterwards, people began to say, land for peace, land for peace. And when uh, Israel signed the, the Camp David Accords, so there was looked like there was a glimmer of hope that finally the bloodshed will come to an end. And what happened? What happened every time a new treaty was signed? Another bomb went off in the bus. This is the peace. And when Gaza was given back, the Jewish community in Gaza was given back, There was no, the, 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 the Arab leadership of Gaza did not acknowledge, on the contrary, they reaffirmed their determination to destroy the state of Israel. And the original peace treaty called for the turning over of terrorists. And not one terrorist was ever turned over by the Arab community by the Arab nations. On the contrary, to this day, Arab terrorists, the families of Arab terrorists are given money by the Palestinians. So, but in spite of this, in spite of all these things, was at the UN time and time again. They would talk against the state of Israel. They would talk against the Jewish people. They would ignore the, the shooting of rockets into the state of Israel. They would ignore terrorism. What would they say when there was a terrorist attack? When the terrorist attack, they would say, we hope the cycle of violence will come to an end. Translating that into English. The Arabs can do whatever they want to the state of Israel. The state of Israel has no right to defend itself. So, and then we see many, many take the side of the, of the Arabs J Street, all these groups. And I'm not talking about non-Jews. I'm talking about Jews. They take the side. What do we see over the passage of time? The impact and the influence that, that, that uh, uh, the impact and the influence that the attitudes of the nations of the world have upon the, on the Jewish people. So the reason we have to answer, the reason we have to answer the, 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 the nations of the world is because we have to, if we don't answer them, ultimately we become impressed with what they said, even though it's obvious that it has no basis at all. You look at the press, what did the press say in those days? Anytime a, an Arab child got killed after he threw stones at Israeli soldiers or in the crossfire, they would have a picture of an Arab woman crying. But when they take a Jewish child in a cave and bang his head, 
against the walls of the cave. There is silence. It's not the same headlines. You know, Rosh Hashanah, we say, we, 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 we blow a hundred kolos, hundred sounds. Why a hundred sounds? Because the mother of Sisera, when Sisera, the arch enemy of the Jewish people, died. So she cried a hundred times. The question, what's it got to do with the, with the chauffeur? And I think it is, when the mother of Sisera cries, the world listens. When the mother of the anti-Semite, the mother of the murderer cries, it gets headlines in the paper. When the Jewish mother cries, when bombs are placed where there are carriages of little babies, when terrorists go into kindergartens and kill little children. And everybody talks about Gaza, the missiles in Gaza that they purposely put next to schools and next to hospitals. Does anybody talk? about when Gaza shoots missiles into cities, into Ashkelon. The world is quiet about it. So why? And what's problem is that Jews themselves are no longer protesting that. Because unfortunately, we have become influenced by the nations of the world. We have to answer them. Not because we're going to change their mind. We have to answer them to make sure that they don't change our mind. And that's a halacha, that's a law. Part of the mitzvah of kibush aritz, of conquest of the land, is to know that the land belongs to us, that the land was given to us through Abraham, Yitzchak, and Yaakov by God himself. Because the more we realize that, the more we are capable of keeping the land. Now, and it's interesting, the Ramban says, he says, okay, that explains the need for Barashas Barah for the story of creation. But who needs the rest of Chumash Barashas, the Ramban says. And the Ramban says, Parshas Noah comes and tells us how God created the world to not tolerate sin. And he says what's true about the rest of the world. Kalvachomer is certainly true about the land of Israel. The land of Israel is like a prince. He has a, the land of Israel has a sensitive stomach. The land of Israel will spit up sin. And then it comes to tell us how God gave the land to Abram, Yitzhak, and Yaakov, to Abram, Isaac, and Jacob. So the whole Chumash Barashas is to impress upon us that the land of Israel belongs to us. Now, the question is, why is it that up till recently, the nations of the world, including the United States, to a certain degree, especially the United States, did not recognize Jerusalem as the capital of Israel. It's a fact. Jerusalem has now been in Israel 75 years, part of Israel. And so, you know, I remember as a boy the dispute about who, who should represent China in the UN, where the Taiwan or what was called in those days Red China. And I'm no fan of Red China. 
And especially today, we know the havoc that they, uh, the havoc that they, that they created in the world. You know, you're not allowed to say uh, the Chinese uh, virus. I don't know. I heard that I had the German measles when I was a kid. And I don't remember anybody demanding that we call it the Nazi measles. But anyway, so the, the, um, uh, so the, the, uh, the, the, so what, what was the message? What was the message? But I thought it was really foolish. I have to say that was my father's influence over me. I probably would have believed your country, right and wrong, still your country. Okay, but my father did not have that attitude. And my father would say, it's a denial of the facts. How can you call Taiwan China? That's China. He said, as far as the UN is concerned, red China is China. It should be that way. But the United States initially was obstinate. They refused to recognize the facts of life. We don't like Red China. We certainly do not like when they go shoot protesters. Although people are trying to hide that now, selective memory. But we, we, but the facts are the facts. You don't want to let them in the UN. Don't let them in the UN. But saying that Taiwan represents China, I remember in, my, in the block I lived in New York, there was the House of White Russia. And I moved out of my house in 1966. So as late as 1966, there was a building that represented White Russia that came to an end in 1917 or 1918, whatever it was, in the early 1900s. Did anybody think that that was the embassy of Russia? No one thought it was the embassy of Russia. But somehow, when it comes to recognizing Jewish life, the Knesset is there, all the offices are there. No. We have to deny the facts. Why did they have to deny? Listen, there are a lot of countries that we don't like. There are a lot of countries that do terrible things, that shoot their own citizens in cold blood. But we recognize them, and we recognize their capital, and we recognize their capture of lands after a while. But Jerusalem, that's the exception. Jerusalem is the exception. Why is it? Apparently, there's a message they want to give. What is the message? Now, you have to ask, what is our right to the land of Israel? We were in exile 1,800 years. What is our right? Are we merely occupiers of the land? And that question was asked of Ben-Gurion, who not exactly the most religious person on the, was not exactly the most religious person on the face of the earth. And he, he says, do you have a contract for the land? And he took out the Tanakh. Now our right to the land of Israel is the historical right that's emphasized in the Declaration of Independence of the State of Israel. And while I'm at it, I want to mention that my father in the living room had the, in the, the Declaration of Independence of the State of Israel hanging on the living room wall. And, and I can tell you that a lot of people were upset about it. So the, the um, so what, 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 but Jerusalem was the historical capital of Israel. By not recognizing Jerusalem as the capital of Israel, 
they're in effect saying, yes, we recognize that the Jewish people are in charge of the land of Israel. But it's not a historical right. They are occupiers. And unfortunately, what happens when they have that attitude, when they have that attitude, some of our brothers and sisters get that attitude also. And they begin to say that the Jewish people are occupiers. So the significance, the fact that the United States, which is the major country in the world, recognizes Jerusalem as the capital of Israel, gives recognition, will have an impact on, it, will, it is a preventive measure for many of our people saying, saying to the contrary and saying that we are occupiers. And I just want to add uh, that one thing. By recognizing Jerusalem as the capital of Israel, we're recognizing the historical right of the Jewish people, not only to Yerushalayim, but to Tel Aviv also. And if we deny the historical right of the Jewish people to Jerusalem, long term, we are denying the right, the historical right of the Jewish people to Tel Aviv and the rest of the state of Israel as well. Just want to add one thing. We're getting uh, that this week, Sedra, Jewish people are camped around the Mishkan. And Medrash tells us that the Jewish people, when they, when the Jewish people uh, were the different Shvatim were camped around the, the, the Mishkan, the tabernacle, it was in the same order that they, were, that they wore when they were taking the Aron, the coffin of Yaakov. What is the significance of that? And I think the significance is the following. Families eventually break up. They become tribes. One moves here, one moves there. And ultimately, especially after the elders of the family, the, great, the patriarchs and the matriarchs of the family die, the bonds that hold the family together are loosened. The purpose of the Mishkan by the Mishkan, the Mishkan, in a sense, there are two perspectives that we have of the Jewish people. The Jewish people are a nation. But nations, after they go into 1,800 years of exile, they cease to use their ident lose their identification as a nation. Perhaps they have ethnic identification, but not uh, the identification as a nation. Jewish people are unique. Why are the Jewish people unique? Because the Jewish people are family by virtue of the Torah. But even by virtue of the Torah, the Jewish people are a family. It's a nation because it's a, it's a nation because it's a family. When somebody goes to Geras, when someone comes a convert, so he becomes a descendant of Abraham Avinu. Av Hamon Goyinus Akicha becomes a descendant of Avram Avinu. I think the message that HaKadosh Baruch Hu was giving is that Jewish people did not cease to be a family when Yaakov Avinu died. It's the Mishkan, it's the Beis Hamikdash, it's Yerushalayim that keeps them as a family together. We have to understand. And it's interesting, the halacha was when the Jews would be Ola Larego, that when they go up for Yanta. So halachas that sometimes made one not be involved with the other were lifted. Certain halachas were lifted because when they were Ola Larego, that was expression of them all being a family, of being Beish Yisrael, of being the family of Israel. And, and we have to know and it's brought down the Ran in Tainus and, uh, and the Tashbats 
and the Maritzchias all point out that even after the Churban took place, even after the destruction of the Beis took place in the time of the Rishonim yet, the Ran says, as is the custom today, many Jews would go to the land of Israel, and even when they couldn't go into Yerushalayim, they would stand up, they would come to Israel and stand afar to look at Yerushalayim. And they, the and Sukkis, it's brought down, they used to, they used to march around Harzaisim. When they did the Hoshanas on Hoshana Rabbah. Why? Because the coming, to, this was the coming together of the Jewish people. They came together as a family. It's like different, different sections of the family. Children get married to have their own families. But then Yontif, at least in the old days, everybody would come together at the parents' house. And even after the base of Mikdash was destroyed, the Ran and the Tashbat said, even in their days, many Jews, and that's why um, that that's that's why the Saint Talmudar is postponed a little bit in Eretz Yisrael. Of course, it's before it's done here in America. It's postponed because of the Jews who came to Eretz Yisrael, even after the base of Mikdash was destroyed in order to give them time to return home before the rain, the, 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 it started raining in Eretz Yisrael. And that's what we have to know. We have to know that our right to Eretz Yisrael is emphasized, the historical right, only with the recognition of Yerushalayim as the historical capital of Israel. And we have to know that Yerushalayim has to be something that brings us together and not separates us. Okay. Any questions? Okay, one question is, uh, how come we have Yom Yerushalayim and Yom Ha'atzma'ut as uh, separate holidays? And would it make more sense to have them as one holiday? Um, I, I think, <laughs> Under ideal circumstances, my feeling is that Yom HaTzmut uh, would include all the miracles that took place within the state, within the state of Israel. But uh, I, it, 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 I, I think Yom HaTzmut, although unfortunately I think the reverse is true, I lived in Eretz Israel for a number of months and uh, I was somewhat disappointed with the way Yom Ha'atzmut was celebrated, and I was overwhelmed with the way Yerushalayim was, uh, Yom Yerushalayim was celebrated. For some reason, Yom Yerushalayim attaches itself to the hearts of Jews in an idealistic manner, more so than Yom Ha'atzmut does. So for and that reason alone, I would think that it, could be a, it should be a separate celebration. And to, I can say something else. Yom HaTzmut is a celebration celebrating the, celebrating the, the, the founding or the refounding of the State of Israel. Yom Yerushalayim celebrates our being able to keep the State of Israel, even when all the nations worked against the State of Israel. And sometimes we focus only on the beginning and we don't focus a little bit, you know, people celebrate. We, we have three holidays. We have Simchas Torah, uh, we, have the, we have Shavuos, and, uh, and we have Yom Kippur. Uh, Shavuos, the Torah was given. Yom Kippur is when the, the Torah, to a certain degree, was accepted, re-accepted. They came down with the Sechen Luchos. Simchas Torah was expresses of joy that we have the Torah. And I think to a certain degree, Yerushalayim is expressive of the fact that we're able to keep Eretz Yisrael in addition to getting Yerushalayim. Okay.
Um, and just this is a quick question, which is gonna there's gonna be a bigger question following that. Uh, do you say halal on Yom Yushalayim with a bracha? Okay, first of all, I don't make a bracha on halal neither on Yom Atzmut nor on Yom Yushalayim because in order to make a bracha, it has to be a required mitzvah. And the Rambam, the Meiri in Psachim says, uh, uh, every individual, who had a miracle, could set that day, uh, in every year, lomar esahala, below bracha, to say the hala without a bracha, the chain had been the chold tzibor v'tzibor, and that is true about every every group as well. So the Miri seems to say that unless there was a takanas chachamim now, chachamim means chazal. So unless there was a takanas chachamim, we cannot make a bracha because we can't say the tzibanu. We can only say the tzivanu if there was a takonis chachamim. So, but there is a mitzvah in saying the halal. So, even in Yom Atzmut, but I do, I, I say halal, I say halal in Yom Atzmut, I do not say it in Yom Yerushalayim, even though I celebrate Yom Yerushalayim, I don't say tachanun, I'll have a special meal Thursday night uh, to celebrate Yom Yerushalayim, but I, I don't say it because the Rambam in Hilchus Hanukkah says that when they instituted the Halal of Hanukkah, they instituted it because the Chazra Malchus was Yisrael, Yoser me Masayim Shana at Korban Hashem. The rulership of the over Eretz Yisrael was returned to the Jewish people for more than 200 years until Churban Vayishani. That means the hollow, even though there were many holidays during the second base of Mikdash, and many of them after Hanukkah was instituted, hollow was said only on Hanukkah. Hollow was said only on Hanukkah because the hollow of Hanukkah was not only for the establishment of the Jewish government in Israel, but the hall of Hanukkah was for the continuation and the perpetuation and the survival of the Jewish government in the state, in, in, in Eretz Israel. Okay, what's the second one? Uh, the follow-up, does it make a difference that, uh, that a miracle took place very quickly, like the Six-Day War was very quick, versus Yom Ma'ut that it was a period of many months? Uh, I don't see why that should make it. I don't see why that should make a difference. I would suggest that uh, that that uh, it certainly adds the fact that the, the Jewish people were victorious in a six day in a six day period certainly adds to the nature of the miracle. Uh, and one could question what would have been the outcome if it hadn't been done in a short period of time. Of course, we have faith in our Kaddish Baruch Hu, and we're sure that the Jewish people would have survived in Eretz Yisrael, but that could be the reason why it only took six days. Okay. Any other questions? No. Uh, so thank you very much. Um, okay. For those of you who... Uh, who missed it or know of people who weren't able to be at, uh, on it, it'll be posted on YouTube within a few more hours. You could search uh, Rabbi Moshe Soloveitchik and Yerushalayim or something like that. You'll be able to find it. So thank you all uh, for joining and thank you, Rebbe, for the share. Everyone have...